Assalamu alaikum and good morning. Uh, welcome to the 99th Distinguished Lecture Series organized by the Faculty of Engineering, uh, UTM. My name is Nick Rumzini Idris. I'm the head of Power Electronics and Drives Research Group, uh, School of Electrical Engineering. Today, we are very delighted to have uh, Professor Malik El Buluk from the University of Akron to give us a talk titled Reflections on Advancement of Power Electronics Technologies and Their Impact on energy research, education, development, and applications. Prof Malik is very close to our research group, which is the Power Electronics and Drive Research Group here in UTM, which is, uh, he, he, we have known or met him, I think the first time when he visited UTM in uh, early 2000, um, and several more after that as a visiting professor giving short courses, uh, keynote speech to the conference that we organize as well as evaluating our evaluated our electrical engineering programs here in UTM. Okay, so without uh, further ado, I would like now pass this session to our Dean, Prof Rafik, to introduce you to Prof Malik. Doc, uh, Dr. Nick Rumzi, thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to our 99th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafik and I am the Dean of Engineering, University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Malik Al Buluk from the University of Akron, USA. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Dr. Malik Al Buluk is Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Akron, where he has been since 1989. During 1986 to 1989, he was with the Faculty of Electrical and Computer Engineering Department and the Electric Power Research Center at North Carolina State University. He attended graduate school at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, 1979 to 1986 where he received the MS, EE, and Doctor of Science degrees, all in electrical engineering. He received the BSc Honours degree in electrical engineering from the University of Khartoum in 1976. Dr. Al Buluk is a registered professional engineer in the state of Ohio since 1991. He has been involved in research and development at NASA Glenn Research Center and Ohio Aerospace Institute, OAI, where he has been a summer research fellow from 1991 to 2015. His research at NASA includes modeling and simulation of the Space Station Freedom, SSF, the Power by Wire, PBW, the Power Electronic Building Blocks, PEBB, the Starter, Generator, and Sensorless Control of Electromechanical Actuators, EMA, for the more electric aircraft, MEA, extreme temperature power electronics for deep space missions and aircraft engines, and recently in advanced energy systems at the Green Lab Research Facility. Dr. Al Buluk is an, is an active senior member of IEEE, and he has published over 120 publications in IEEE conferences and transactions and some of his papers prize awards. He also constantly reviews papers for IEEE conferences and transactions and has organized and chaired a number of conference sessions for the power electronics, the industry applications, and the industrial electronics societies. He was an associate editor for the IEEE transactions in power electronics, the IEEE transactions and industry applications, and an editor-in-chief for the Manufacturing Systems and Development Department of IAS Transactions. He also served as a member of the Executive Board of the Industry Application Society and the Chair of Manufacturing Systems and Development Department. So that is the biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Malik Al Buluk from the University of Akron, USA, with a lecture on power electronic technologies. Professor Malik Al Buluk, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Rafiq and Professor Nick Ramzi. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen and uh, get going.
Okay, my topic is really a collection of um, some of the work that I have done in courses at the University of Akron in power electronics in the research area of power electronics, and also some of the literature review that was done with a number of PhD students that I have supervised or co-supervised at the University of Akron. So I intended to be more general and uh, not too deep uh, so that I don't, uh, because I know there is a wide range of spectrum of uh, audiences. And um, with that, I will start and I will try to finish within the time uh, to leave some time for questions and answers. Um, uh, outline of my talk, I will give an introduction and just define the power electronic systems and uh, give some of the uh, applications of power electronics. And then I will talk about two uh, applications of power electronics, basically to do with the grid modernization and the electrification of transportation. And then I will talk at the end about the energy and power electronics education in the past, the present, and what uh, the, the future would look like. Uh, the power electronics system is a power processing unit uh, between two electrical systems in which you receive raw power in and you get a desired power out with whatever voltage, current, uh, power, and frequency. And uh, examples of the raw power, it could come from a battery, uh, fuel cells, the utility, solar, uh, photovoltaic, wind, capacitors, inductors, energy storage, or other DC and AC sources. And then on the load side or the desired power, it could be motors, it could be the utility line, could be computers, other equipment or other processes. So the power circuit itself contains ideal switches. I will elaborate on that, ideal inductors, ideal capacitors, and ideal transformers. The ideal switches is to shape the waveforms and then the inductors and capacitors is to absorb and, and filter the whatever uh, harmonics or other things that are unnecessary. Uh, and then the ideal transformers sometimes are needed to uh, for other applications where isolation or reduction or um, reduction of the uh, stress on the device. So if you look at it, it's a three port system with a power in, a power output, and a control uh, input that could be analog, digital, and could use classical, modern, modulated, unmodulated, hybrid. Those are all definitions that will become clear as I go through the uh, illustration of the power electronic system. So these are the power electronics components. The resistors are kind of the load, usually, if we consider that it's I, all the, the Four elements in the past are ideal. There is lossless system, inductors, capacitors, and then all of these, whether PNPs, NPNs, MOSFETs, or, capac or, or uh, trans uh, uh, relays, those are the switches. And then the ideal transformer and diodes are also the switches. Now, we largely categorize semiconductor switches. These are power semiconductor switches. Those are electronic switches. They can be controlled or uncontrolled. And in the uncontrolled, the diode family is uh, governing all of this with different types. And then in the control, we can be semi-controlled like the thyristor family. And then the fully controlled is the uh, transistor family, whether of the MOSFET type or of the uh, bipolar junction transistor type or of the hybrid types like IGBT and, and other uh, uh, double mechanism devices. Now the power electronics conver converters, they uh, play an important role in the processing and control of uh, systems of various applications from small scale such as energy harvesting to large scales such as power generation transmission in the utility. They use semiconductor switches operated at different frequencies from 50 hertz, 60 hertz at the uh, utility line to hundreds of megahertz at radio frequencies. 
and they optimally support the different features of diverse applications to power converters to benefit from characteristics such as isolated, non-isolated, voltage-fed, current-fed, hard switching, soft switching, and so uh, forth. Now, so when we look at this, the input in electrical could be an AC or a DC source. The output, which is the load, could be a DC or an AC. So then we can categorize the power electronics converters as AC to DC, AC to AC, DC to DC, and DC to AC. And then here I highlighted a number of things that go into the converters, like the switches can be controlled, uncontrolled, they can be hard or soft to switch, and they can be line or load force commutated in terms of turning off. And then the converter could be isolated or non-isolated. And on the AC side, it could be variable uh, frequency, variable voltage, and it could be constant, variable voltage, constant frequency. It's supposed to be constant frequency. And then the overall ratings of the uh, converter, consider the voltage limits, the current limits, the power limits, the frequency, the volume, weight, temperature, and cooling. And finally, those comes into the cost come as the consequence of those. So just a quick, a quick uh, look at those converters. Uh, the AC to DC converters are usually named as rectifiers. They're used to connect most home appliances and most of the front end of many equipments connected to the electrical grid are processing their power through rectifiers. DC to AC converters are inverters that are used in most renewable, renewable energy in connection to the grid and AC motor drives to provide constant or variable AC voltage and frequency. DC to DC converters, short name choppers, provide the required voltage when operated from battery or other DC sources to uh, loads that require DC uh, voltage. And also they, they play a big role in the connection of the energy, uh, the renewable energy, such as solar and wind to the uh, utility. And the AC, as I said, could be AC controllers. Those are variable voltage constant, constant frequency and cyclo converters. Those are variable voltage, variable frequency. They're used to change the voltage and frequency of an alternating current or voltage source, such as light dimmers in, at home and other home appliances and AC motor drives. Now here is just um, some examples and snapshots of uh, power uh, converters. Uh, this is a, a rectifier connected to a three-phase DC fed by uh, a capacitor called as a DC link into uh, a, an inverter. And here is a single phase uh, AC. The, the AC is single phase and it's a three phase. This is fully controllable, both the rectifier side and the inverter side. And this is a single phase, fully controllable, the rectifier and the uh, inverter side. And then this key building to get to higher voltages and current, you take these modules and put them into different modules. These are, are also half bridge, full bridge uh, modules. And then you can connect them to, to bring what we call uh, multi-level converters. And this is just a shape uh, by connecting these and switching as you add them, you can get kind of close to sinusoid in which that the total harmonic distortion and uh, <clears throat> is very little and not much of a need for passive uh, filtering. So it's most of the active filtering due to the switching, but at least it will get to the capability of high voltages and current. Now, the power electronics loads, broadly I can classify them in two categories. The power supplies, there could be DC power supplies, there could be AC power supplies, and then within those, there are many types of them depending on the frequency, the switching, uh, resonant power supplies is one type, and the direction of power flow, is it one uh, from the load to the to the source 
or is it just from the source to the load or is it bi-directional? And then the switch mode power supply is a big area, especially in, in the uh, computer uh, power supplies. And uh, those are, you can categorize them as isolated converters and non-isolated. And again, also you can go into different types and depending on the power handling capability and the voltage and current rating. So I'm not going to go into those details. Now, the other big load to the uh, power electronics is the electric motor. And those, again, are categorized widely into DC motors and AC motors. Um, and they have gone through the years in many uh, different forms from induction uh, to which are asynchronous and uh, synchronous motors with different types, whether they are permanent magnet or whether they are using some power electronics to uh, create the field that's called electronically commutated. And then um, also uh, the DC motor, which is mostly kind of uh, permanent magnet machines are also still taking uh, play into some of the applications. So motors is a, a big loads of the uh, power electronic systems. Uh, the, a big thing that went into uh, the power electronics, they are mostly, uh, they require control techniques. And uh, I think power electronics is considered as a big applications of control systems, whether uh, modern control systems or classical control systems or analog control systems or digital control systems. Here, I just give a snapshots of some of the techniques that have been used in the modeling and control of power electronics, averaging techniques, state space averaging, describing function, generalized state space averaging, cyclic averaging, discrete averaging, and reduced order averaging. These are all techniques that have been used in some applications or others. Modular and non-linear techniques, the G parameters techniques, component connection techniques, hybrid modeling, linear parameter varying, uh, the up and off or uh, linear parameter varying um, techniques and discrete time techniques. Those are digital techniques, approximate sample data models, uh, and then sample data models and fully discrete uh, models. The other thing that uh, goes into the control of uh, power electronics is the uh, modulation techniques. Those are techniques that are used so that rather than using techniques where the, uh, the harmonics are, are very close to the desired voltage or integral multiples of the, um, of the uh, voltage that is needed, uh, the pulse width modulation or the modulation techniques uh, move the harmonics to way far um, uh, range so that their filtering is not required much of a passive but mostly done in an active mode. So there is what we call carrier-based uh, BWMs in which you have a high frequency triangular wave compared with a modulating signal. And then the comparison results in some digital signals. And then at the end, these are put together to achieve some pulsating voltage that is at the end, you want it to form a sinusoidal. And here you have a, a modulating signal and a carrier at different phase shift. And that results in a voltage at the output that's almost sinusoidal. Another technique that was used is space vector PWM. That is, um, especially in three phase applications, you have three legs, upper switch and lower switch, and then you have three voltages coming. So you have uh, all together uh, eight switching states and six of them are different and two of them are the same. They uh, call the zero voltage uh, states and so the switching is done is to choose one of the switching and those six vectors or the zero switching and then that's achieved and it's widely used known as space vector pulse switch modulation. Another technique is what called optimal selective harmonic elimination in which you use the chopping in a certain angles so that you eliminate certain harmonics. And, and here is also another snapshot of the classification of the pulse switch modulation from the carrier-based PWMs to the space vector PWMs to the optimal 
and the sub different categories of each one of them. Uh, the modeling of converters also, especially in the motor drives, have taken what we call vector control strategies, direct torque control and field oriented control mixed with other kind of uh, control techniques like hysteresis based or state vector uh, pulse width modulation, model based predictive control, sliding mode control, artificial intelligence, and uh, like fuzzy logic and neural network, stator flux oriented, rotor flux oriented, or grid flux oriented. That is for uh, systems that are connected to the grid. And here are a snapshot of some of the closed loop. Uh, Switch, this is a closed loop, typical switch, closed loop of uh, switch mode power supply in which you go through a pulse switch modulation chip to um, turn on the switches on and off. Uh, these are field oriented control is now widely used, whether directly or indirect field oriented control in, in AC motor drives, and then uh, state vector pulse switch modulation and another technique called direct torque control, which is much simpler, and it takes uh, it take care of a lot of disadvantages uh, that in field-oriented control is also a very applicable uh, type of control in motor drives. Now, the power electronics application, um, I think two of the big things that I will talk about today is the grid-connected systems, uh, and then the transportation, whether uh, talking about just um, air transportation or rail transportation or sea transportation ship, and then the home appliances and uh, other uh, electronics uh, that uses power electronics, whether uh, connected to the grid or, or, or uh, uh, wireless connected. So those are all different applications of power electronics. And I think just the, uh, the energy sector that connect with the, uh, all of these are connected with some in what capacity with the power electronics applications. Now, there's a number of challenges and uh, opportunities in power electronics. Well, the power electronics research, development, and application are driven by the need for lowering the cost, improving the efficiency, and improving the grid resilience, reliability, and security by advanced control system integration of the renewable energy, for example, in the latest. The progress in wideband gap device technologies such as silicon carbide and gallium nitride, uh, plus advanced manufacturing packaging techniques have offered new opportunities for innovative designs that can achieve a higher efficiency higher power density and improve equipment reliability. There are three components, the IGBT modules and the MOSFET modules, and then the silicon, these are silicon devices, and also they, are, they have their counter in the silicon uh, carbide devices and the gallium nitride. So the largest share of the power market is the silicon MOSFET devices and the IGBT. Uh, the power electronics research and development are increasingly making the transportation cleaner and more efficient through the solution uh, to put electrically driven and advanced development of next generation plug-in electric vehicle, hybrid vehicles with advanced combustion engines and other alternative fuel vehicles like fuel cells and so forth. And the advancement in power electronics in un uniting the transportation and grid modernization sectors to achieve a flexible, reliable, efficient, and resilient energy delivery system, data managed infrastructure that enable the secure management of information and distributed energy architecture that support integration of renewable energy sources and energy storages uh, with the grid system. So the global power electronics market, uh, from what I got into the literature is about $17.5 billion and the automotive market is the biggest in that share. Now, I wanted to talk about the power electronics in grid modernization and electrification of transportation. 
And I will focus about two areas, renewable energy sources and microgrids, and the electrification of transportation, which is the um, uh, all electric aircraft, the hybrid and electric vehicles. And the ship is also uh, in the all ship, uh, all electric ship, but I'm not going to talk about that. And then uh, I will talk about the uh, the last one is the uh, energy. So this, now I'm get, going to get into the second part of my presentation. Now, the vehicle efficiency or the gasoline engine efficiency uh, is, is small, about only 25% of it comes out, and so the rest of it is exhaust, although there has been a lot of improvement in recycling the exhaust and reusing it and to improve the efficiency, but still uh, the pollution is the big uh, disadvantage of uh, gasoline engines. And that is, has two in the uh, power generation, electricity, that is uh, very uh, coal and, and uh, gas and oil are uh, the things that are uh, <coughs> used in terms of the pollution. And also in transportation, um, the fumes that come from uh, the transportation, this is kind of a typical picture of uh, rush hour or uh, in which the highways, although wide, is still they are full of uh, cars and the, uh, the uh, fumes and the pollution is quite a bit. So the, the green and or clean energy mandate is to is to get sustainable environmentally friendly energy and the key issue is climate change and the energy efficiency and the need for secure and reliable energy and also smart energy due to the so the the energy pyramid is defined as three sections to it the renewable energy the energy efficiency and the energy conservation so the energy industry trends and compared to the power electronic solutions, broadly, the energy industry trends can be categorized in three concepts. One, the decarbonization, which is a transition to clean uh, or carbon-free economy, integrating, increasing the share of renewable energy. The decentralization, that means the geographic distributed electricity with a large number of multi-producers and consumers the decentralization enable lower energy densities and provide opportunities for utilizing renewable energy sources in grid connected or non-grid connected. And then the digitalization is just that everything is becoming digital, implies a widespread of digital machines and devices and computers and the levels um, of the power system from producing infrastructure and user device to moving to intelligent energy power management solutions. The power electronics provide solutions to those. Um, the clean energy, solar, wind, and at, at water, geothermal, and others, uh, the secure, they provide secure and sustainable energy and power electronics has put a lot of share into that. Um, and then in the control and communication too, and so that will make the renewable energy generation competitive, competitive to the traditional resources. And the, in the electrification of transportation, the power electronics have, have been used in electric and hybrid vehicles, all electric aircraft or more electric aircraft and all electric ships. And so those have made, the, they're becoming cost competitive to the internal combustion engine cars and planes. So the energy conservation, which the hybrid and electric automotive or the hybrid vehicles, the plug-in hybrid vehicles, electric hybrid vehicles are examples of the energy conservation. Here is uh, just a snapshot of the progress in the uh, light vehicle production, which is small cars and vans, I guess. Um, and that you see from 2018 to 2027, uh, they have been quite a bit increased in fuel cells, electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid vehicles, and full hybrid and mild hybrid. I think those are all definition in the degree of hybrid that you put between electric and internal combustion engine. Uh, this is a snapshot also of these, but it goes 
uh, into the production uh, until uh, 2035, based on some statistics, um, include all uh, sales quantities. This is just the sales of uh, plug-in uh, electric vehicles within the U.S. And you can see uh, from 2011, there is this kind of exponential rise, uh, and, and that's only done until 2016. So that uh, can tell that, and the power electronics is a major player in that role. Now, this is just to show also, this is the European um, uh, Commission um, in terms of the emission uh, standards, and uh, it's kind of giving the uh, carbon uh, dioxide uh, in terms of uh, its quantity per kilometer, and that transfer into how much, how much gallons or uh, liters in the European system that you can use uh, per how many miles or kilometers. And so that is, as this keep getting smaller and smaller, that means the, the use of uh, gas uh, and the pollution levels are, the use of gas is improving and the pollution level is getting smaller and smaller. So that's either getting through the smaller uh, hybrid vehicles with better combustion or through completely electric vehicles. Now, these are just the snapshots of the uh, different types. There are three types of the uh, electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles. Uh, one of them is called the series, in which that the vehicle essentially uh, it's uh, electric with the, uh, the engine acting as a generator to, to produce power to charge the batteries. But the point here is that you will see uh, motors and their drivers, and then you will see other DC to DC converters that um, feed into the uh, into the charging of the of the batteries. Although here there is an alternator through the internal combustion engine. Uh, and the other one, this is the parallel, and the parallel you have two systems: the internal combustion system and the power electronics and motor drive system, uh, they can be working together or they can be uncoupled. And then they are responsible for the drivetrain as well as the charging of two batteries um, within the system, the large battery, the high voltage battery and the uh, low voltage battery. And um, this is um, called the uh, plug-in hybrid in which Rather than the internal, that internal combustion engine size is reduced quite a bit because you can charge the batteries at night uh, <clears throat> through plug at, at either at parking lots or at home. So that is kind of favored by most of the government agencies, the academia and the industry as a solution, the plug-in hybrid vehicles. And it has a better uh, energy density in terms of the use of batteries that are used in inside the uh, the um, the car, and also the range that the the battery the the car can go uh, without need for charging. Uh, I think there are a lot of things that you have to think about. This is a snapshot that showed that you have to think about the power rating, the high efficiency, the high frequency, the low cost, and the temperature, uh, and the cooling system, and the high current. So. Each of these power electronics has different uh, limits, and that um, shows that still the need for uh, improvement is there. Now, the, the charging technology is also has gone into two types, what we call commercial conductive plug-in charging systems, in which you come like a gas station. This is also an electric charging uh, station in which you get in and plug in the car uh, to charge, and uh, they live differ as, at different levels. So they have, I have a display that will show the different levels uh, in a few uh, uh, slides. Uh, or uh, they could be a wireless in which that there is a, a charger on the bottom of the car, which we call the transmitter, and then there is a, 
a receiver on the car, mounted on the car that is connected to the charging system. That's wireless charging system. And that's done also in uh, either when the car is moving or the car is parked. So the wireless power transfer, there is what electromagnetic or electrostatic, and then within the uh, electromagnetic, there is inductive, and the one that is gaining popularity is using magnetic resonance. I think this one that uses microwave is something that probably for the need for the future application of power electronics. And here is a snapshot of the uh, the uh, of the wireless charging in which you have the transmitter and the receiver, and then that's connected through a wire to the control uh, of the charging unit. And so there is power electronics on both the receiver and the, the transmitter. And here is also uh, the regular plug-in, which is you get from the AC to DC, and there are DC to DC to to charge both the high voltage battery as well as the low voltage battery. Um, in terms of the wireless, uh, this is an example of the uh, resonant in which you have uh, a three phase rectifier, control rectifier into uh, a single phase inverter, both on the transmitter and the receiver and then to the load. And um, this is a, an example of uh, a wireless system that was done by a doctor student in our lab. Uh, it's a seven uh, kilowatt system uh, driven at uh, 85 kilohertz um, switching frequency. Uh, the problem with the wireless, I guess, uh, the frequency is the emission and how uh, much emission is uh, electromagnetic emission that is allowed uh, and uh, because that affects the uh, health of the human. So there are limits uh, to uh, that has to be followed. And those uh, are standards that has any wireless charging system has to uh, do below the standards that are needed to uh, maintain the safety of the human from radiation. Here are the different levels of the, uh, the charging of the uh, conductive batteries, level one, and level two, and level three, um, and then the, um, also the, the low voltage battery in the car, and also it has, these are just different examples of different cars uh, that has uh, <clears throat> these uh, charging systems. Now, I think there is a, some countries are taking actions to decide to, to end or to get into zero emission or low emission um, uh, transportation in the electric and hybrid vehicles. Uh, Norway, 2025, Iceland, Ireland, and Israel, Slovenia, and Netherlands, 2030, Denmark, 2035, and uh, uh, 2040, 2050. I, I think this result, I, I'm not sure, uh, but 2050 is the, shoot, the time that everybody's shooting to go to uh, zero emission. Now, the more electric aircraft and the all electric aircraft is that, as you see here, is just that every part of the uh, aircraft is electrically driven or electrically, uh, uh, electrically supported uh, different, different positions of it. I don't want to uh, expand into that. But the, the difference between, the main difference between the traditional aircraft and the more electric aircraft is three things. One is the, is the replacement of the uh, hydraulic and pneumatic actuators uh, with uh, electrical actuators or electromechanical actuators, which is power electronics and motor drives. And then the, there is a new auxiliary power unit design 
in which that the whole distribution system of the uh, AC and DC distribution system within the uh, airplane uh, is being completely changed. And I think there is, uh, <clears throat> this is in the new, in the old conventional aircraft, everything is hydraulic and pneumatic and mechanical, less electrical, the electrical use for lighting uh, the, and avionic systems. Now, when you look at the old one, you are getting uh, a 115 volt AC and 28 volt DC. With the new one, you are getting uh, the motor drives and the electromechanical uh, actuators plus the distribution system that goes into uh, 270 volts or plus or minus 270 volts, which is 540 volts. And then also uh, an AC that goes up to 230 uh, volt AC. So that is a whole new uh, uh, distribution system. Now there are challenges that are facing the more electric and the all electric aircraft. One, the requirement of superconducting machines to reduce the specific power. And I think uh, it's envisioned that the superconducting power generation or power distribution will be ready for incorporating in an aircraft power system within the next 30 years. And so that is quite a bit of time, but still at least that it is a challenge that is facing the all electrical and the more electric aircraft. The power electronics, I think it is the, it is the energy density or the power density. Right now, the silicon-based devices are about 2.2 kilowatt per kilogram, and they wanted to push it to about nine kilowatt per kilogram. And it's envisioned that within the next 20 years, the silicon carbide power electronics for aircraft will get that to the level of uh, power density that's needed. Uh, the battery is another, the battery is another uh, factor or challenge. And I think that's also expected um, the result is that the current batteries is far from being suitable for all electric aircraft applications. So still, they may require some more uh, battery work in terms of the energy density and the power density. Now, the next one, I will talk about renewable energy. And uh, in renewable energy or alternative energy, other than nuclear, the rest are uh, renewable energy. And I will focus into two, uh, wind and, and, and uh, solar, which is a solar, wind and solar. Uh, those are the two ones that are taking the big share in terms of the application of renewable energy and the use of power electronics. Well, it still, it looks like, although this is um, about 12 years away, uh, uh, 12 years back, uh, but the renewable energy uh, use is penetrating, but still a small portion uh, compared to the coal and the natural gas and the nuclear power generation and the oil, which is still the big share of the electrical power generation. Now, just the, the, to connect the renewable and alternative is to, with the power electronics, uh, here is just kind of a, a program, a, a, a diagram that I made to show uh, how you go from each energy source through whether mechanical to electrical conversion or directly connected to the through power electronics to the different loads, whether in a standalone or whether in grid connected. But and then energy storage is a big factor in the uh, development of renewable energy because renewable energy are not available all the time, especially wind and solar. And uh, here is the uh, US um, share of uh, electricity sources. And you can see that the uh, electric, the, the renewable energy is still a small portion compared to uh, the other, the coal and natural gas and the nuclear and the hydroelectric. In terms of the well generation, I think uh, the electricity, uh, 
uh, contribution. Coal is the largest in oil, the natural gas, and then uh, the hydro, and then this is an old one, but the, it, the renewable are penetrating, but this is an old, but the idea is to show that this is still a challenge to renewable energies and their penetration into the grid. So the driving factor is that the uh, climate control and the European uh, emission, and then the demand for uh, that the prices of uh, gas are increasing. And there's a lot of standards, I don't want to elaborate on this, but there's a lot of standards that are developed to uh, improve the efficiency as well as to uh, get secure energy and clean energy. So we, on one side here are the distributed energy resources, whether fuel, cell, photovoltaic, wind, micro turbines, or energy storage. So the, the power electronics connect these with the load, whether with the grid or without the grid. So these are called islanding modes and these great connected modes. And um, that lead to what is known as microgrids. So microgrids are the interconnection of um, renewable energy to get kind of a standalone unit that can work in an islanding mode that's by itself or through uh, what is uh, switching with the connection with the grid. So microgrid in these four quarters, it's energy efficient, resilient, uh, innovative financing through public-private partnership because you get small groups and then sustainable. And then it eventually that lead to the uh, smart grid technology, which is the deployment and integration of advanced electricity as storage and big shaving technologies to include plug-in electric and hybrid vehicles and thermal storage and air conditioning so forth so these are all factors that go into the uh, smart grid um, the energy storage are also a developing uh, components uh, and their growth in terms of the use because they are needed and they are the ones that support the uh, the sustainability of uh, renewable energy, and in the absence of them, they you can use either the grid or you can use these energy storage devices. So the grid modernization gets into the energy storage, the distributed generation, uh, the um, monitoring and communication, and so the customers themselves are also becoming or will become involved in the choice of their power and and and, and control of their uh, their uh, their consumption, and then the hybrid and electric vehicles, and then the all electric transportation are all different parts of the of the uh, modernization of the grid or what we call smart grid. So. People refer to it as a macro grid for a micro, uh, versus a micro grid. The traditional grid is a macro grid, and uh, if it's the the micro grids are a number of them that can connect or disconnect from the grid and operate in a standalone mode. And so that kind of where the micro where it came from. Now the other thing that the renewable energy and the availability of the power electronics is the um, is that before DC distribution systems are not available. Now this has uh, the renewable and the power electronics has facilitated a DC distribution system as well as the AC distribution system, as well as hybrid AC and DC. So those are all different configuration and architectures of the uh, microgrid. And then here is a small comparison of the uh, of the uh, conventional smart grid, and there are quite a bit of um, things to be gained from modernization of the grid. Going backward. And um, the wind energy uh, is also on the rise, and uh, this is another snapshot showing 
the wind energy uh, over the years. And I think there might be, uh, those are taken from some of the my doctoral students, but I think uh, there are more probably ones that are, uh, that goes beyond uh, the years that have shown. So the uh, power electronics and is uh, in the electric machine, as well as the power electronics uh, in the, uh, the generator and the power electronics. That's what comes into the, uh, the contribution of power electronics in wind turbines. So when you look at it, it can be driven through gear system or through uh, direct connection, and it can be a permanent magnet or a double effect induction generator uh, or, uh, or a, uh, uh, um, a catch induction uh, generator. And here are the configuration and the power electronics that requirement in each one of them. It looks like I have to run a little bit. And here is um, some of the uh, control systems that we have developed. Uh, one is using um, maximum uh, power uh, transfer system, and one is using uh, direct uh, uh, power control uh, by two PhD students. And uh, they also have been experimentally verified in the lab. Uh, the solar, we have also done some work on, um, here is the, just a typical uh, solar system. They can be unidirectional, they can be bidirectional uh, with battery and um, with the other renewable or uh, non-renewable uh, source. Um, you can configure the, the photovoltaic integration with the utility, which is a microgrid voltage. Either can be a direct DC to AC or a DC to DC followed by a DC to AC. And that just changes the degrees of freedom in terms of the duty ratio and the modulation of the DC to AC converter. Uh, this is... Because the different modules that are done by also one of our doctoral students, Ali Re, feedlock loops, real power control, reactive power control, and harmonic estimation and elimination or compensation. And then another one done by also our one doctoral student is energy uh, shaping process controller for solar. Both they have validated their experimental results on a laboratory experimental results. And then the last thing I want to talk about is energy education. Uh, traditionally, I think there has been quite a bit of change in terms of power from, I'm talking about um, 25 years ago until about 10 years ago, these had been switch mode power supplies and high voltage and high uh, current power supplies. Uh, the motor drives, uh, the electromagnetics uh, in terms of capacitors and inductors, and then the uh, traditional power system um, courses in terms of uh, analysis, stability, and transient analysis, and also the power system planning, and then the uh, integration of facts or high voltage DC systems and the power quality. Now, here's a snapshot of when I joined the University of Akron, we had these kind of courses with traditionally power system, power system analysis one and two, power system stability, power system distribution, transmission, protection, and uh, industrial power systems and electric machines one and two. So it's all the classical power. And so we changed the curriculum to include a little bit of courses at the required, which is an energy conversion course, and then courses at the senior and first year uh, classes, electric motor drives, modern power systems, hybrid and electric vehicles is some of the courses that we added to uh, get some of the up new application of power electronics. And then power electronics one and two are, one is a, a first year graduate. And then we have graduate level courses that are dynamics, 
of electric machine and control of electric machine, and then due to the uh, to get the renewable energy, we have of course modeling and control of renewable energy sources, and then we have traditional courses uh, that has to do with the dynamics and control of power electronics, power electronics too, that talks about components and the protection systems and power semiconductor devices. And now the clean energy system involves it's a multidiscipline engineering. It includes biomedical engineers, chemical engineers, civil, electrical, mechanical, nuclear, and material. And also some people from mathematics and natural sciences and business and management, economics and social sciences, and many disciplines. So that requires, that means there has to be a new area of teaching energy in terms of incorporating the renewable energy, the smart grid technologies, the smart lighting and displays, the energy storage devices, the fuel cells, and the distributed generation, microgrid, and the transportation, hybrid, and electric vehicles. So this cannot be fit into any BS degree. And so the master degree, people are looking at the solution that the master degree, or what you call short uh, courses or certificate that fit into the industry needs. And uh, if you look at integrating the clean energy, you require people from power systems, people from communication, motor drives, that's just within the electrical, computer engineering, energy storage devices, renewable energy, power electronics, and smart and microgrid. Those all have to be integrated into new uh, teaching. And then, uh, there are a number of master courses with without research, and uh, there can be different varieties. Here is just a snapshot of a number of universities that are developing master degree with different names, including the renewable and the uh, transportation. Then the long term, in my opinion, still, what is the status of fossil fuels? Will people move completely to renewable energy to achieve the timing that they have put for zero emission? And then what is the future of energy research and the smart grid technologies and the resources, the, ener the uh, distributed energy resources and the energy storages, hybrid and electric vehicles? The progress of all of this is a question of uh, the assessment of how long it takes to get the, uh, the modernization and the uh, modernization of the grid and the uh, clean transportation. So uh, that takes some time. And so what is also the multidisciplinary research programs just needed, whether in power in research or in education. So it's a smart grid, whether it's gonna be a decentralized or a total uh, large grid. So I use a number of references and uh, I wanna give credit to the graduate students and my uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Elma Soder and uh, Dr. Suryan uh, Choi, who were faculty at the University of Akron. And we have shared a number of doctoral students. Uh, this is just a number of them. Uh, and then other references that I have used. And with that, uh, I think I have taken longer, but I will stop and hopefully we can entertain some time for questions. Thank you, Prof. Malik, for the very interesting talk. You start off with a very basic of power electronics and then you develop to a more advanced applications in the uh, uh, transportations and uh, renewable energy system applications. Um, we are waiting for the questions uh, right now. If there is any question, please post it to the uh, Facebook page. If not, then probably I can ask because the time is approaching 10 now. So. Probably I can ask you one question. Sure. <laughs> yeah, because I remember that when I uh, first uh, learned or studied power electronics in my undergraduate programs, uh, I used to study the, uh, we used to study inverter and using the uh, silicon control rectifier SCR. And it takes some time, you know, just to study on the commutation circuit, to, just to turn off the SCRs. Uh, and now, a day, which is uh, probably a couple of decades afterwards, after that, uh, we no longer see the you know the contents of this uh, uh, classical uh, 
SCR turn off circuit commutation circuits in the uh, contents of power electronic textbooks or syllabus. So my question is, what do you think is going to be the future contents of the syllabus for these power electronics uh, courses? Is it going to be more, you know, towards the applications, or is this a uh, because uh, of the of the of the modularized uh, power uh, electronic converters nowadays? I think that that is a. a, a I guess it, it comes from an expert. I think it, it's a good question because that's true. Actually, all of the classical uh, commutated inverters and, and the use of uh, thyristors and SC, SCRs, uh, really what you see with some of the snapshot that I showed is that uh, there's a, a rectifier, whether it is a, an uncontrolled rectifier or a fully controlled rectifier that uses uh, transistors and, and, and diodes bidirectionals. I think those are becoming the dominant devices. And so I, I, I remember I gave talk similar to this, but about maybe 20, 25 years ago about motor drives uh, in particular, and at that time, I think there was a lot of devices. There was the thyristor, the gate turn off thyristor, the uh, the uh, the bipolar junction transistor, the other different types of turn off thyristors, and then the IGBT was taking a very small portion in that. And there is a the mass control thyristor, and then there is a the MOSFET at the high frequency and low power. But now. It looked like that whole spectrum is taken by two devices, the MOSFET and the IGBT. And uh, it used to be the silicon, and now it is the, it is the, uh, it is the silicon carbide and the wide band gap uh, uh, devices. Back to your questions, I think eventually, if power electronics is started as a graduate, as a graduate program, and then it penetrates itself into the undergraduate. Because power electronics is very difficult to teach at the undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. too complicated. So in my opinion, with the applications and all that, power electronics is going to come back to the, to the graduate application and, the, and how it started. And then the, it will it slowly get its way to the undergraduate. So whether using the modular approach and uh, those, I think that will go into the, into the graduate, which is either research or project, uh, project uh, oriented courses. But then after some time when things are developed and textbooks are available for undergraduates, because for the graduate, really the textbooks are not as critical but for the undergraduate, the textbook is a much. You have to have a, a, a structure of a textbook, not just uh, telling the story and the references, but you have to have examples and you have to have um, homework problems at the end and so forth. So I think that is my, my response is that this, all of these developments are going to go into the graduate teaching and then as things develop more and more and textbooks are available, the undergraduate may take a little share of that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, we have one question here from Dr. Sharifa. Can you read that? Yeah, uh, I truly appreciate your comprehensive presentation on energy ranging from technology research education. Thank you for sharing with us. What is opinion on the battery disposable of electric vehicle, the evolution of energy, do need agility on skill knowledge. How can university adopt this effectively to meet the demand? Well, if I understood, I think as far as the disposable battery of electric vehicle, that is where the other people are thinking about. It's not going to be clean and zero because there are um, those disposable batteries have their also chemicals associated with them. So I think my answer is that I think that is a concern that people are putting as a challenge to the um, 
hybrid and electric vehicle and the increase of the use of batteries also with the uh, renewable energy. Now, the evolution of energy uh, on the skill and knowledge, I think, I think that is a good question because there is part of my presentation that I took out uh, in terms of um, in terms of the energy sector and it and their need, and I think what the conclusion out of that is that there is a demand for technologists and technician more than engineers because to support all of the infrastructure that's going to replace the traditional systems, you need technicians more than engineers. So I think uh, that the the statistics that was that came out out of that study that I did not show is that uh, the the skill set are needed are more into the technology um, degrees, and I think the the university probably are going to adopt them because uh, I think there has to be. Uh, I think some universities are now combining their engineering and technology programs. And in the U.S., there is what is called STEM colleges in which they combine uh, uh, science, mathematics, engineering, and technology. Those all in one school or all in one college. So I think that's in terms of how they can adopt this and how they can meet effectively the demand because uh, those New techniques, new um, technologies require multidisciplinary nature. And uh, also it requires skill that has to do with, as much as developing them, how to use them. So, and to, to use them, you need technicians because those are the kind of the connection between the users and the developers. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we have uh, um, passed through one hour limits that we have. Okay. Already. Yeah, so I think I, I'll be, before we start, I, I will pass back the session to Prof. Rafik to give you the closing remarks. Dr. Nick Rumzi, thank you so very much for moderating the session. And thank you as well for introducing Professor Malik to me. Uh, we had a chat before this webinar and Professor Malik mentioned that uh, he was here in UTM many, many times and uh, was here as well back in 1999. So uh, I joined UTM in the year 2000, so I missed one year. Uh, <laughs> if, I, if I joined UTM earlier, then I would have met uh, Professor Malik back then. Uh, Professor Malik Albulog, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And thank you so much for a great sharing session on power electronic technologies. And to all our viewers worldwide, thank you for watching UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Especially tomorrow, we have our 100th DLS. So it is going to be a special event tomorrow. So until next time, bye-bye to all of you. And Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Alaikum Assalam. Bye, Prof. Malik. Bye. Assalamualaikum. Thank you, sir.